Have you ever thought that uh, words can be suitcases? You see, for Paul, Paul, rejoice is a suitcase. A suitcase is not just a suitcase, is it? And um, the point of a suitcase is that there's all sorts of stuff in it. So um, if you were going on holiday to the Mediterranean, you might have some flimsy clothes, some some sunshades and sun cream. Or if uh, like this suitcase is designed for, then you you might be going on a business trip and, and you might have a laptop or you might have uh, some papers, some shirts, spare tie in case you drop your coffee on it, that kind of thing. Paul packs meaning into the word rejoice, like packing a suitcase. And every time he uses the word rejoice, he expects us to unpack our suitcase. Paul keeps using this word rejoice in the strangest of places. Like when he was talking about when gospel preachers, who sadly were out to undermine his reputation. He says in chapter one, verse 18, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. And, and like when he was expecting his imprisonment might well end in his execution to verse 17. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. In both cases, the reason for his rejoicing is because he knows that by his humiliation, by his persecution, by his suffering, because he did not put himself first, he was living like his saviour, the Lord Jesus, who he describes so beautifully in chapter 2, verses 6 to 11. And we'll be saying those words as our creed later on, as we have done throughout this series. When Paul uses rejo the word rejoice, then he wants us to unpack our suitcase to see where his rejoicing comes from. And it comes from the resurrection victory of King Jesus. That means he can become more like Jesus, ready for eternal life. Have a look down with me at chapter three, verse 10. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. We often think, don't we, that we can only rejoice if our emotions allow us to or if our circumstances are good. But Paul treats it as a command. He commands us to rejoice. Chapter 2, verse 18. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. And then in our passage this morning, chapter four, verse four, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. If we have any doubt as to Paul's main point and Philippians and what it is that he is looking for the Philippians to do, it is to constantly rejoice. And so we must unpack our suitcase to understand where that joy can come from, to know that the joy comes from knowing what we have and what we are becoming in the Lord Jesus. That he calls our safeguard in chapter three against religious self-righteousness and against worldliness. And in our passage this morning, it is the antidote to unreasonableness and to conflict, as we saw earlier. So what is it that Paul means for us to keep rejoicing in, in situations that 
for us would normally stop us rejoicing, right? And Paul's answer is the reason we can't seem to rejoice in those situations like he can is because we worry. Paul says in verse six, do not be anxious about anything. You see, he's saying that the enemy of joy is anxiety. The killer of rejoicing is worry. And that's because, you see, worry takes our focus off Jesus and becoming like him and puts our focus back on ourselves and our circumstances. So are you worried about COVID-19? Are you worried that loved ones may get it? My father was diagnosed with leukaemia about a week before the lockdown began and I'm two and a half mile hours away and I'm his only child and I'll be honest with you I'm worried how could I not be but Paul says in verse six do not be anxious about anything is Paul just unkind demanding of us more than would possible would be possible for anyone but the most detached saint not if you read on because his command is also a do as well as a don't have a look at verse six again do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your requests to god So this is not about screwing yourself up and pretending that the bad stuff isn't really happening or doesn't really matter. Quite the reverse. God here through Paul is inviting us to bring everything we're worried about to the king of the universe. And ask for his help. This is God we're talking about here. He runs the show, right? He holds every sparrow in his hand. He numbers every hair on my head. He knows everything. He can do everything. And he says that I, little me, can come into his presence whenever I want to, to ask for his help. So I may be two and a half hours away from my dad, but I know I can entrust my dad into his care. And in doing so, I remind myself of all the good God has already done for me. And I give thanks to him for it. As the song goes, don't worry about the future or worry But know that worrying is as effective as trying to solve an algebra equation by chewing bubblegum. Christian people can do so much better than that. We can take our worries to God himself, along with thanksgiving for all he has done for us in Jesus. And if I do that, Paul says, this will be the awesome result. Have a look down at verse seven. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Just as in chapter three, rejoicing was a safeguard, he said. Now God's peace will guard our hearts in verse seven. Just as rejoicing is the antidote to unreasonableness and conflict, so prayer is the antidote to anxiety and worry. Because we pray, and as we pray, God is redirecting our minds away from ourselves and our circumstances and back where it should be onto him. So as anxiety and worry threaten our joy as Christians, if we accept this invitation and bring our worries to God, 
God himself will come to us and give us peace, assure us of his goodness to us and give us confidence that nothing we worry about can take from us that never ending life that we have in Jesus. It's so simple. Don't stew over your worries. Simply take them to God in prayer. Yet so often that is the last thing we do, isn't it? When all else has failed. Still, I want to encourage you that even if it is the last thing that you do, God will still honour his promise in this passage. It would just save us an awful lot of pain and heartache if we cut to the chase and took it to the throne of grace straight away. And this next song is a golden odie that makes that point simply but clearly. And after that, Patricia is going to lead us in prayer together. So let's sing. 